Welcome, everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Every week, we try to bring you stories that will inspire you. The goal is, is to have you look at the things that are interesting to us as Rotarians, service above self, and our special interest in our club of education, innovation, and entrepreneurship, and to say, oh, my goodness, that's amazing. This is exactly the kind of story I need to share, right? That, that's our goal. And we reach out to people around the world to talk to us about really cool and interesting things. This particular day, we are talking with someone who is in Hong Kong. And so Hong Kong uh, is, is a place for which issues related to our current world situation are, are all the more of, of a moment. Uh, we might ask you a little bit about that later. Uh, but his name is Vince Su, and he is the co-founder and managing partner of Press Start. Uh, Press Start Hong Kong is, is a gamification outfit, and he is going to tell us a little bit more about that. Vince, it is a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having it. Thanks for having me. Um, it's great to speak to you guys and um, an honor to be part of the illustrious lineup at the Silicon Valley Rotary E-Club. Um, yeah, so I have prepared just a little bit um, of something to share. Uh, Rushton mentions that I do do a little bit of work within gamification and education. Um, and yeah, I, we operate by this thing called gamification 2.0, um, which, you know, everything is 2.0 and 3.0 these days. So we like to sort of give gamification kind of like a makeover as well. Uh, so I'm going to walk through a little bit of that and yeah, hopefully this is interesting and useful for some of you. Cool. So gamification 2.0, um, and this is kind of what we do. So I have a, about a 10, 12 minute thing to walk through. Uh, just as a basic intro, so as Rush mentioned, I uh, run a company called Press Start Hong Kong. Um, we are a games consultancy and our mission is to change the world through play. Uh, we are about four and a half years in, started off as a side project and now uh, we have a small team uh, working full time on this. Um, and that's more, so Press Start Hong Kong is more of the sort of corporate outfit. So we do a lot of consulting work uh, with, with corporates when it comes to um, gamifying like living and development, uh, recruitment, um, and marketing and things like that. And we have just launched uh, in December of 2019 uh, what we call Press Start Academy. So that's our first foray into after school education. So this is our first B2C product. Uh, we launched our winter 2019 uh, program lineup, like holiday programs. Um, back in December, and then we were going to go hard for Easter, uh, but then the school shutdown happened. So um, originally, um, we had a vision to do a lot of things around analog games and analog experiences. Um, and we've actually been sort of pushed to experiment uh, with online learning, which has been very interesting. Um, but Press Art Academy has been, uh, is a is an after school education concept. So think of your regular after school learning center, except all the learning takes place via play and games. So um, that's quite an interesting sort of messaging that we have like a dual messaging, right? Um, sort of approach where to the parents, um, you know, uh, parents are um, getting the message that their kids are doing the same academic learning as they would in a uh, top learning center. Uh, but for the kids, they're coming to have fun. And hopefully this presentation gives you a little bit of uh, uh, a glimpse into why we sort of set up that way. So originally um, we have a lot of uh, content on gamification, history of games, societal impacts and importance of games. Um, I'm going to cut right to the chase um, and just talk about gamification because I think within the education innovation space, gamification has been a buzzword um, for quite a while now. Uh, traditionally, it has meant the use of game elements and game design techniques in non-game contexts. So the easiest thing that I can uh, you make as an example is like an Air Miles loyalty program, where you have very simple uh, mechanics like points and badges and leaderboards and things like that that incentivize you to uh, practice a behavior or accomplish several tasks that uh, someone at the back end wants you to accomplish, right? And let me illustrate to you um, with an example. Uh, I'm a huge soccer fan. Uh, in fact, I'm a Liverpool fan. And I am more than bummed that the Premier League has been suspended because I was actually planning to go to Liverpool to watch us lift the league. Uh, so 
yes, that um, has been quite frustrating. I used to be um, a sort of freelance sports writer uh, while I was working my corporate jobs uh, on the side. Um, and this is actually my writer profile from a website called Bleacher Report. Um, those of you in Silicon Valley might have heard of Bleacher Report. They are doing quite well these days after their uh, acquisition a couple of years ago uh, by Turner Sports. Um, but right when they started, right about, I'd say like eight to 10 years ago, uh, they operated using uh, a quite big uh, community of fan writers. And this was to get a lot of traffic, a lot of, uh, to build community among fellow fans um, to keep writing. Um, and they would have like different writer programs and I joined one of the, the writer programs. And you can see uh, from this um, dashboard, uh, from this writer profile, um, all of the gamification 1.0 techniques that, I had been alluding to just now. So underneath my, uh, next to my name is my display picture and underneath that right there is levels. And if you play online games or any sort of video games, you'll know that the levels, that is quite important to a lot of the players. In this case, I was Chief Writer 3. Uh, doesn't really matter what that means, uh, but that's the level that is attached to my name. Underneath uh, my name, uh, is you can see the different avatars, different uh, signs for like, there's a red shirt and there's WF. So WF is world football and red shirt is Liverpool. And that's the leaderboard, right? And so uh, basically every time you see a red shirt there, that means I've placed uh, first to third in the overall uh, Liverpool writers leaderboard. So on the right side, you will see two WFs in a row. That means that there was one month that I didn't place in the top three and they make it clear to you. They're like, hey, like you can see all of these laid out. This is where you were not part of the leaderboard. Right underneath that, there was a, there's a ranks and progression. So that is how many reads you, uh, my articles have received and ranked. So even if I'm feeling good that I have 4 million plus readers, it tells you right there that my rank is only 340. So there are 339 uh, people with more people reading their stuff uh, compared to mine. On the right side, that's the achievements. So you see the badges and these are arbitrarily set goals, right? Milestones. So if you, for example, hit uh, a thousand uh, views, then you get a bronze medal. If you hit 2000, that's a silver medal and, and it sort of uh, stacks up uh, going up there. Um, and, and the same for like how many comments your, your, comment, uh, your articles have, have reached. And then you'll have all the sort of avatar social graphs and, and the fans um, like down the bottom. I'm gonna use this as a template. I'm gonna come back to this when I talk a little bit about uh, player psychology and how that sort of fits within gamification. Uh, first, um, going back to um, the topic that is dear uh, to the Rotary E-Club Silicon Valley's heart, uh, which is education innovation. Um, so when we do our uh, work in education, whether it's um, doing B2B work with schools and educational institutions, uh, doing professional de development for the teachers and helping them with curriculum design. Um, or <clears throat> when we design our own programs for Press Start Academy, um, we generally see games in education um, across two spectrums. So the first, uh, I'm gonna use an example here to illustrate. Uh, this is a game called Math Blaster. Um, and I used to play this a lot uh, when I was in grade school. Uh, if you've played this, great. If you haven't, it's quite obvious what this game is, uh, wants to achieve. Um, it wants to teach you about math concepts, basic sort of grade school math concepts. Um, and it dresses it up like a story. So in this game, you are trying to uh, catch like a bad guy as he sort of whizzes through space and you're completing different tasks on like different planets and there are different sprites and different characters that assign you these things. Uh, we call Math Blaster and games like Math Blaster educational games because the education portion comes first. Now, why, is, like, why do we say that? Well, because first of all, it's called Math Blaster, uh, where in the title itself, it's already made very obvious that this game is about the math thing. Also, you can see very clearly that this is uh, very accessible for parents and teachers, right? So what I used to have like in school was um, the teacher would basically call, ah, oh, class is up, time for Math Blaster. And really, if you kind of pick that apart, that's really just code for time for homework, except 
this is a more animated and more colorful version of homework. Uh, but on the back end, uh, the teachers are able to print out like a report to see if Rushton got two times zero equals zero correct. Right, so they're very sort of uh, report driven, assessment driven uh, type experiences. Um, some of you might recognize this game. I love this game. I used to play, spend hundreds, if not thousands of hours um, playing this game growing up. It's called SimCity. Um, obviously there are various iterations, um, but this is an example of a game that we call, of a segment that we call games that educate. And that's because it puts the game first. I like using this example to explain this concept because um, I have never met anyone who has played SimCity to learn about urban planning, but I have met many urban planners who've gotten into the subject because they've played SimCity. And this is a great example of a game environment that is compelling, that is engaging, and that pushes you to learn more about the subject at hand without you actively seeking to upgrade yourself in that subject. And what I mean by that is um, when you play SimCity, naturally you want to set a goal for yourself and be like, oh, I want to hit a city of 1 million population, or I want to have you know, a very well-balanced city. Um, I want to have a metropolis here, uh, the capital here, or uh, like a more rural area here and things like that, right? And, but before you can get there, um, the game doesn't you know, structure itself where it's like a module of level one, learn waste management. These are the different principles. It just kind of throws a sandbox environment at you and you are forced to learn how waste systems work, how power systems work, how water systems, how policing systems and all of those things work by yourself if you want to get to the level that you want to hit. And so that's actually quite interesting because you end up um, trying to push yourself in this game like environment to do better and on the side you get all of the benefits that all of the educational games uh, want to promote as well so you are pushing yourself to uh, learn and get to that next level just all of your own accord and that's really interesting to us right and for what we do at press start both the press start hong kong the uh, consulting side and for press start academy the education side is to take environments like this and principles that make environments like this and port it over um, to other um, general education or recruitment or other corporate type settings. So you can see here, these are, I'm not gonna go through this entire list, but um, these are the examples of soft skills and hard skills that you can teach via games without having to structure uh, like assignments or homeworks uh, or, or levels like that within the game. I'm just going to spend a minute or two uh, just to go through what I alluded to earlier, which is uh, game psychology. And this is how we sort of um, uh, get interest from our corporate clients as well, who always ask, what if, uh, you know, how can games uh, help an organization? Um, and what if not everyone likes to play games? Well, first of all, not everyone likes to play games, but everyone likes to have fun. So it's really about how we translate that having fun into turning that into like uh, incentivization for playing games. And this is actually a quite interesting graph, right? This is um, based on Bartle's uh, player psychology profile. So uh, on the y-axis, you have acting versus interacting. On the x-axis, you have players versus world. Um, and you can very clearly see how these sort of stack up. There are on the uh, sort of top left, there is uh, the killer's profile, which are based uh, more on the player side and acting. So they're defined by winning, right? So it doesn't matter how you do as long as you are doing better than all your competitors. So in the example here, uh, that is the example of the leaderboard and of the ranks and progressions. It doesn't matter if like I could have gotten a hundred views on an article that month, but if everyone else got 80, I would have been like number one. Right. So that's always the competition side on the other side, on the right side, that's the achievers. And that's very based on uh, sort of objectively set milestones. Um, and this is the same case as the badges. It doesn't matter how I'm doing with other, uh, in comparison with other people. As long as I hit 10,000 article reads for this article, I'm going to get a platinum badge or something like that. So and it's the same case as, you know, when you when you're in a, in a test. Right. If 
I get 60 points and everyone else gets 40, I'm still the best in class. However, a 60 in the, arbitra- in the objective scoreboard, that's still a D, for example. Uh, and so this is sort of like the difference there. And then obviously you have the socializers, the explorers, socializers are the people who go into a game experience, wanting to share that experience with other people predominantly. And then the explorers are the ones who go into a game experience uh, wanting to explore the world. So for a lot of open worlds, like online RPGs or uh, computer-based RPGs, uh, role-playing games, um, then those are the ones that want to complete every quest. Those are the ones that uh, want to hit and talk to all of the characters and do all of the side quests and things like that. So generally speaking, you have these four player profiles, and that's actually quite interesting because these do not just exist in game worlds, right? You can easily imagine that anyone going into a work environment might have uh, different motivations like this. And so it's about designing systems and designing environments where um, you can sort of see how different people are motivated and design incentive incentives um, to get them more engaged. And this is where the game-like uh, environment uh, makes, it, makes that engagement process a lot more fun. So I'm going to um, sort of end with just this. Um, I know I called this gamification 2.0. Uh, for us, it's not really like the technical definition of um, you know, using like non, uh, game-like context and non-game, uh, game techniques in non-game context. It's really for us, the, the central theme is just to build something fun first uh, and then build everything else around it. Because if you have something fun, that hooks people already. And then you can come at it from all the different psychological perspectives and you can design multiple game mechanics and incentive systems uh, and learning experiences around that as well. And our tagline for Press Start Academy is creative creativity is intelligent having fun. And so why not make fun time productive time as well? So I'm gonna end my sharing there. Um, this is an example of our Easter program lineup. If you guys are interested, I'm happy to go through and share some examples later as well. Thanks guys. <laughs> Shags in the house. Excellent. Yeah, Vince, go ahead and, and uh, stop sharing the screen for the moment. Um, and, and let's let's uh, introduce the folks that we've got on the call. We have got several of our members here. My name is Rushton. I'm uh, a I'm charter president of the Rotary Club of Silicon Valley. And uh, right under me, as I've got things arranged, uh, is another charter member, uh, and that would be Shag Shagrin. That would be you, yes, good man. Uh, uh, we have Cecilia Babkirk, recently returned from uh, her Peace Corps work in Ethiopia. Good to have you here with us, right? Uh, and, and a guest of the, of the club and a friend of the club, uh, John Font. Good to have you here from Sacramento. All right. So with that, you know, let's, let's start into some of our questions on this front. Um, I, I was particularly interested uh, as you were given the presentation, and our, our folks watching the recording wouldn't see this, but uh, we have a chat that goes on at the same time as well. And, and both games that, uh, that Vince mentioned, Shags immediately was like, we did that, I bought that for my kids. Shags, we did, what? we did, it was great. Some like me are more collaborative and some people are very competitive and you address that and I honor that. So when you create a game, it's one where all can feel appreciated and as if they were a victor of sorts. So bravo. Excellent. So I am curious how the uh, you know how how bringing these games to clients has has been an interesting experience for how you learn about games, right? So maybe if you pick a client and and kind of talk about some of the, some of the things you've seen as a part of that, that'd be great to hear. Sure, um, I can share like a, a, like a short case with you guys if, if you're yeah. interested, like a, a short example. So um, this is actually a client that we worked with last year actually can anyone guess um what this client is based on the um colors colors hmm. was it red and yellow yes mcdonald's well, yes that's correct <laughs> All right. yeah so so this was with mcdonald's hong kong last year and um it, it was it's not a game that was uh, sold retail uh, to McDonald's customers. Uh, rather, it was something that we worked with them uh, for the recruitment process. So 
um, this was actually quite fun for us because um, I've been also involved in quite a few talent uh, management programs before. Uh, so I joined one of those like management associate programs uh, in banking before, like as uh, at the start of my corporate career. And then as part of that and my two consulting jobs afterwards, I've always been involved in uh, sort of assessing potential candidates uh, in the talent pipeline. Uh, and this is actually a, like a high potentials uh, program uh, for McDonald's. So it's, you know, you go in, you go into a small branch, you sort of uh, work your way up into branch manager, and then you get promoted into a bigger branch and sort of uh, at the end of the program, you go back to corporate uh, and you sort of help on the strategy side. So, so what they wanted to do is to transform the candidate recruitment experience and uh, with a very specific goal of redefining uh, what an assessment center looks like. So traditionally, I don't know if you guys do this in the States, uh, but traditionally an assessment center here in Hong Kong uh, brings together about like 40, 50 people, separates them into different groups, generally speaking into different rooms. And you have group interviews, panel interviews, and a case study that everybody works on together. Um, and very often, this is a super competitive process because everyone's like, I need to beat everyone else in order to get this job. However, for a position like this, in a program like this, what they wanted to do was actually um, assess talents on not just like their critical thinking presentation uh, and all of those things, but also teamwork, collaboration, and leadership. Uh, and they didn't know how to figure, uh, they, didn't, they couldn't figure out how to do that from a traditional sort of case study and panel interview uh, uh, a format. And so this is what we did. We did a small game called Restaurant Tycoon, which is actually uh, like a reskin, like a simple reskin of a game that we have designed, uh, co-designed um, on innovation. Um, and this became a two-part session where uh, the first hour and a half was to play through Restaurant Tycoon, which is a, an F&B themed um, entrepreneurship game where you are drawing cards um, just completely randomly um, in customer demographic, in part of the day, and also a cuisine. So you could very easily be like, I have um, like a breakfast, which is sushi with the brothers. Now, how do you actually formulate an F&B concept? You have to name your restaurant, you have to come up with uh, uh, like how you market it, like your marketing strategy, and also, um, uh, like the pitch and the uh, like a menu uh, within five minutes and you have to pitch it to everybody else. So it becomes a competitive process, right? Now in the afternoon, that is the bottom left picture. Um, we sort of reformatted their existing case study and turned it more into like a role-playing game, like a tabletop role-playing game. So rather than just giving everybody a book, um, we assigned them different roles. So John, you might be the finance manager. Rushton, you might be the operations manager. Cecilia, you might be the HR manager. Shaz, you might be the marketing manager. And this is your remit. And every sort of five minutes, uh, there is a time window for one of you to go obtain all the materials that you need, all the information you need from the head of marketing. So you would get, you would, get that sort of download of material and you go back to your team. This is how we have to work through this case. And then, uh, but those time window sort of is like 30 seconds, right? So everybody has to be able to you know, think on their feet and make decisions as, as a collective. Uh, and the interesting thing is the same team that competed against each other um, was going, uh, carried on and became the team that had to work together uh, for the second quest. Uh, and we did not stipulate this at the beginning. So everybody might start off like being super competitive and then they would have to like figure out how the team dynamic would work, um, who would be sort of the de facto like leader and the PM and, and things like that. Um, and that became like a quite interesting process. But for me personally, the most interesting thing, uh, bottom right, uh, is working with the HR team itself. Um, so we, um, besides designing the game experiences, also designed the assessment framework um, that the HR team would use as they were sort of uh, observing the teams uh, that they were in charge of. So for example, uh, these are the potential scenarios that might come up in game one. These are some potential scenarios that might come up in day two, uh, game two. And the, from different reactions, this is how you might be able to assess and pick apart um, like the different 
uh, skills and uh, techniques that the candidates have. And so all of this was designed to meet originally what the HR team wanted to assess. So it was all aligned with what they, the objectives that they wanted to hit, but we had all the freedom in the world to customize uh, how the experience would, de would be deployed in uh, from sort of in the candidate's point of view. And that was quite fun for us. Um, Vince, I have a question. Uh, yes. So is this primarily a corporate environment type of thing or um, can the games be adapted to be used in environments such as teaching English as a foreign language um, or teaching language? Yes, 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 and yes. I'm so glad you asked that question. And um, yeah, I have another case to share you, share with you. Here we go. Uh, this is one of the first programs that we designed um, that was B2C directly to students. And this is one of the first programs that we're bringing back in-house for Press Start Academy. Uh, and I'm not gonna tell you what the, uh, sort of the skills that the program teaches. I'm just gonna walk through what the experience looks like in the curriculum, right? So this is a, uh, an, a course called King of Hong Kong. It's around nine hours in total, and it's directed to eight to 11 years old. Um, and it's based off of a game called King of Tokyo, uh, a board game called King of Tokyo, which is completely non-educational. And that is exactly the type of game that we love to turn educational. Um, so in a nutshell, King of Tokyo itself is uh, it's a game about a monster invasion in Tokyo. So you open the box and they're like pre-designed monsters and you each have a scoreboard and you basically take turns either going into Tokyo to rack up your destruction points or you try to destroy all the other monsters. Uh, it's a super fun and like awesome game. Um, and that made it a great candidate to turn into a program. And so we customized the game uh, into King of Hong Kong. Um, as a disclaimer, we don't sell this game, so there are no IP issues there. Um, and so this is just something that we um, like 3D printed and, and things like that. And there you, you can see there is a custom sort of scoreboard uh, with um, diff two different uh, sort of the main uh, areas in Hong Kong. But on the left, you will see blank monster boards. And so the first thing that the kids have to do is to create their own monsters. They have to create their own backstories. They have to draw them out and they create their own character cards. Uh, that they bring into the game. So before we even start the game, everybody already has their own monster, right? So you have ownership over the character that you've created. You have ownership over the game. Uh, we've also added several things into the game, one of which is a landmark card deck. So basically what happens is, as the monsters are going through different parts of Hong Kong, uh, they're also uh, picking up a landmark card. And on the top right picture, you'll see that we have a map on the wall. and so. If you, you know, remember like all of the sort of CSI or uh, like the investigative journalism movies where, you know, in this, it has to be a dark room all the time, but all the reporters, all the detectives have to draw like, oh, the suspect went from here to here. Um, this is what we're doing, except these are trails of destruction uh, of all the monsters. And so if Rushton the monster started out in um, IFC, which is a big uh, sort of a shopping mall in Hong Kong, and then he went next to the Hong Kong airport, then you would have the two landmarks pinned and like a thread sort of stretched there. And this would uh, happen uh, for all of the monsters in the game. Uh, so you would play through the game uh, like that and all of the maps would be different from program to program. And in the middle, we would take a role-playing break where different kids would have to take on different personas. So for example, one might be the chief police, uh, the chief of police in Hong Kong. The other might be a, a professor of uh, monster archeology span uh, or monster studies uh, at the University of Hong Kong, right? And they would have to interview each other uh, all based on like fictional stories that they would have to make up on the spot. So like Professor Cecilia, based on Monster Rushton going to IFC first and then the airport, um, how do you think he will, uh, where do you think he will hit next? And obviously this is all like fictional, this is all conjecture, this is all made up, right? Uh, but these are all interviews that they would practice interview skills, they would practice like public speaking, they would practice like creativity, and then they would play through the rest of the game and they would collectively come up with the uh, aftermath of the story. Now, what's really cool about this is for each program that we run, 
all the monsters are different, all the backstories are different, all the games play out differently, and all the end stories and all the interviews and all of those things play out differently. So each program in itself is a different experience. And this makes each program unique. And obviously, I mentioned in the beginning that the messaging to the parents is they still get academic learning from this. And so that output is the bottom right. And this is actually a creative journalism course. So throughout the program, they are learning and they are putting together their own newspaper, learning how to write uh, news headlines, breaking news headlines, uh, learning how to do interviews, learning how to write lead paragraphs, how to incorporate different interviews in the same breaking news story, how to write uh, monsters, uh, sorry, not monsters, <laughs> how to write profiles, how to write obituaries, uh, and how to also like put together event calendars. And I didn't, I don't have a picture of the backside, but, but they also put together their own crossword puzzles, their own ad like classified section. So like a really cool example is uh, you can see uh, the, the monster here uh, on, in the newspaper on the right, uh, that's the monster called Garge. Um, and the origin story is that people in Hong Kong have been polluting and, and throwing out garbage into the streets too much. So there's this garbage monster called Garge. And all through the event calendar, all through the ads, it's about like learning how to manage waste properly so that a monster like Garge will never come to Hong Kong again. Um, so that's one of the things that is inside the newspaper. So it's about creating your own narrative and things like that. So, uh, and this is program one in a series that we call Play and Write. So yes, they're learning language because they're learning creative writing, but they're also learning essential writing skills. But we call it Play and Write because you can't play if you don't write and you can't write if you don't play because everything folds into, uh, everything folds into um, each other uh, throughout the program. Got it. Thank you. Excellent. Question. Uh, so as we always do, uh, we, we try to, to wind things down uh, in, in the 30 minute time frame or so, and we stick around and talk with the speaker a little bit more. So we all have some more questions and we're going to ask Vince those questions after we finish the recording. So all of you who are watching the recording, too bad you missed. Uh, but thank you very much, Vince, for, for your presentation. And it's great to hear about kind of possibilities with gaming and how that can uh, make, you know, all kinds of uh, educational things and, and, you know, corporate goals met, you know, that, very cool stuff. For all of you Thanks. who have been watching, uh, we are excited that you joined us. Uh, give yourself a few points for that. Uh, and you can earn some more points by going down a little bit, uh, doing, the, uh, doing the attendance form. And then also for, for the big, big points, go for the discussion section at the bottom and leave a comment or respond to someone else's comment. We love to hear what you think. So our, our goal every week is to bring you something that, that makes you say, wow, that's just really, really interesting. I hope this was one of those for you. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you think of it. And, and as we always do, we'll leave the last word to our speaker. So back to you, Vince. Yeah, so we've been basically trying to um, unlock the potential of games, so to speak. Um, so if you haven't really explored what games can do for your organization or your school, um, then you're in for a ride. It is super fun. Um, and I encourage everybody just to play first and go from there. Hashtag press start to begin. Boom. <laughs>